My name is Jay. Come with me on a journey to Nairobi, Kenya. I want to show you my life. I live in the Madare slum in Nairobi, Kenya. It's remarkable. Having been in Africa, this feels so authentic. You see everything from the food they eat to the clothes they wear. It feels like you're there. This is my new home. It is a prison. He got thrown in jail and he was nine years old. He was just a kid. My son is 10. <laughs> so we can identify. Wow, if my son was there, what, what would I feel? What would I do? And then imagine what his mom was feeling. You walk out of that prison almost out of hope, and then you walk into hope. This is my compassion center. Compassion is helping me pay for school, medicine, and health care. Yeah, and everyone started cheering for him. It made me so happy. Yeah, we all like looked at each other and like paused it. We're like, yay! It doesn't only show you reality, it shows you how you can change reality. Yeah. I can actually do something. I can actually make a difference. The first time I heard the words, I love you, was from my sponsor. I got to hear that God loved me. They introduced me to Jesus. I want to show you my life. Come with me to Nairobi. All right, so I have some really exciting news. Um, we are going to have the opportunity um, to host the Compassion Experience that they talked about in this movie, December 7th through the 11th. Now, if you're not familiar with what Compassion International is or what the Compassion Experience is, I just want to unpack that for you. Compassion International is an organization that releases children from poverty in Jesus' name. And so how they do this is they partner sponsors um, with children in poor um, countries that then allow allow them to have food for both their family and themselves, um, to have education, and to introduce them to the life-saving relationship with Jesus. Now, the way that Compassion partners, sponsors with these kids is one of the ways is by doing this thing called the Compassion Experience. And it's an opportunity for people to experience what a child in poverty experiences without ever leaving their home. So they travel around and they have these big trailers that fit together that then people People um, come, they put on headphones to listen to the child tell the story of their life, and they walk through the trailer that is set up like the child's house, the child's street, the child's community, so that they can begin to experience what this child experiences. You can experience the poverty that they go through without ever leaving your country. And so we have this phenomenal opportunity to host them and have them right here in our parking lot, which I'm super, super excited about. Um, and me, me and Zach and our girls had actually done the Compassion Experience when we were in Phoenix. Um, we just happened to be going to Chick-fil-A, and there was the Compassion Experience was right outside of Chick-fil-A, and we were like, hey, we have a couple hours to kill, like an hour to kill, like let's, let's try this thing out. And so we went in and we did this Compassion Experience, and it was awesome, like it was even good for our little kids. It created this opportunity to talk about gratitude and about thankfulness and about what God does and how God is the God of miracles miracles when something as uh, difficult and as blanket you're done as poverty sets in. God has ways of restoring people back to life and bringing life into those situations. So it was a cool experience for me. It was a cool experience for my husband, but also for our girls. And so I'm really, really excited that we get to partner with them and, and host the Compassion Experience. But I want you to understand like how we get to host it, because it's kind of this cool, divine, God story sort of thing. Um, we've been talking about for the past couple weeks how we are going to be at the um, Campus Life 5K Butler's Orchard Run in a couple weeks on um, November 18th. And uh, we were planning this out. We got invited to participate in that. And I thought that was a great way for us to kind of introduce ourselves to the community. The reality is, is that even though we are a church that has a very, like, pronounced look of our building, and even though we are on this uh, heavily trafficked road of Frederick, uh, thousands of people drive by our church building every day. Guys, people don't know who we are. People are like, wait, where are you from? Who are you? I don't know. I've never heard of that before, right? Even people who live right around the corner, if you say Clarksburg Church, they're like, oh, I think that's in Bethesda. Like, you know, like they do not know who we are. They, they don't know what we're about. They don't know what we're doing. And so this is an opportunity. The 5K run is really an opportunity to like meet the people 
And like, go where the people are. Like, think of Ariel. I want to be where the people are, right? So we are, have this opportunity to meet the people. And so more than the 5K, and, and really, I mean, Campus Life is a phenomenal organization. And so I'm happy to partner with them in the work that they do to build relationships with students who would never walk in the doors of a church. This is our opportunity to meet the people who would never walk in the doors of our church. And so we're going to be there doing some face painting, handing out some cookies and things like that. But it's really an opportunity to build a relationship. And building a relationship really doesn't happen when you just meet somebody one time and then they go away. So we wanted to figure out, I was trying to figure out what could we invite them to? How could we continue the conversation and continue to build this relationship? Well, we were brainstorming some different things and, and one of the things I was like, we could invite them to come to church, but not everybody wants to come to church. Like not everybody has that value structure of like, oh, I was invited, so now I'm gonna go. Like that doesn't always work. And so we were trying to think like, what would, would the people in our community who are disinterested in church what would they be interested what would be a value add for them and I were thought of the compassion experience and I thought of how it really doesn't matter whether you are a follower of Christ or not caring for the poor is something that's in us especially around Christmas time we all want to find opportunities where we can make sure our kids know how grateful they should be to be here and to get presents. And so we want to expose them to different service projects and, and different experiences to make sure they understand that. And so I was like, the compassion experience. Let me contact them. Let me see if we can get them to come here. So I wrote several emails. Um, and I, guys... I sold Clarksburg Church. I was like, this is the best church ever. We have the friendliest people. So if you want anybody to host anything, it's our people. Plus, we're located 18 miles from D.C. We are on this big road that like dead ends in D.C. We're right off the highway. We have the most diverse community considering Germantown and Gaithersburg. Like, I was all over this. And I sent several letters to them, emails to them saying, like, this is where you want to host the Compassion Experience. We have global connections. We care about the global world. This is the place to be. Um, so they contacted me, and they were like, hey, thanks for like, sending multiple emails like over and over and over again every day for two weeks. Uh, we will respond to you. Um, but their response was, we can't do this until June. Like Our next available thing is not till June. And I'm like, ah, I can't invite people in November to something in June. Like That doesn't make sense, plus Christmas. Like. Everybody wants Christmas. So I decided, all right, we'll get on the phone call. We'll explore the option. Maybe next Christmas we can do it. So when we got on the phone call with them, me and Casey were talking, and, and they said, hey, we just happened to have an opening December 7th through the 11th. We're going to be in your area. It makes sense for us. We hadn't even told them. It makes sense for us to do it then. Like, would you be available? And I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> we'll totally be available. So I was so excited that we have this opportunity to invite the 400 people that were going to be at the 5K run to this experience, um, to this compassion experience. I was like, this is going to be a great way to continue this relationship but then on the phone call they say hey you need to be ready because typically in an area like yours there's about 3,000 people that will traffic through this experience okay <laughs> how many parking spots do I need at a time right and so we figured out, so me and Casey and Josh and Zach were out there in the parking lot, measuring the parking lot, trying to figure out, like, okay, can we fit the trailers? Can we fit the cars? Can we navigate how this whole thing is going to work? And the answer, of course, is yes, we can figure it out. Um, and so, so they said, yeah, we're going to do this targeted campaign within a 50-mile radius to tell everyone to come to this compassion experience. And so you can expect about 3,000 people there. They said, make sure that you have your friendliest people there to host this event because this is your opportunity to tell the community who you are as a church. And I was like, I, I, captain, we can do that. And then they said, make sure you have your next invitation available. What are you going to invite them back to? And so I was like, well, Christmas Eve. We're going to invite them back to Christmas Eve. And so we have this opportunity to invite these 3,000 people to come to our Christmas Eve service. Now, I don't expect there to be 3,000 people that will show up. But the opportunity for us to continue the conversation with these people 
is incredible. The opportunity for us to add value to our entire community is wonderful. The opportunity for us to just get to know the names, to have the honor of interacting with them and hosting them for one day is awesome. And so, if, you, um, if you're interested in jumping on this, like, cool God moment experience opportunity that we have the opportunity to partner and with compassion on, we are going to need some help. Like, there's some help that needs to happen. The cool thing is, is we're not going to do this alone. I've already reached out to several of the other area churches, and they're going to be partnering with us as well. Because I said, listen, we're kind of small, so we may need some help. And they said, we want to help you. We want to help you. So there are other churches in the area that are also going to host with us and, um, and offer. But I want to make sure that our best Clarksburg people, you all, are at the table, are welcoming these people. And so um, there's going to be some sign-up sheets in the hallway right out here that tell you what times and, and what we need and all of those sorts of things. Generally, uh, most of the work is just hosting. It's greeting. It's making sure the, the, the experience is kind of a timed experience. So you will let the next people go through and let the next people go through. It's a great one you can do with your kids. Um, if you do it with your child, they want a one-on-one -on -one sort of thing, and you'll sign up as a unit excuse me, a unit together. But it's a great, great experience for you to do. It's a great experience for us to have in the community to let the people know that we're here and to say, we want to help. We want to we be here for you. We want to build a relationship with you um, long term and continuing on. So really, really excited about that. I hope you guys are excited as I am about that. It's super, super cool. Um, so today, to jump into what we're talking about today, we are going to be talking in the month of November um, in a new series called Hidden. And we're actually going to be looking at some of Jesus' parables, the parables that Jesus teaches in the book of Matthew, specifically chapter 13. Um, now, the word parable is kind of like this churchy word. Like, you don't go and sit around with your friends and say, hey, I got a parable for you. Like, you don't, you don't say that. You don't do that. And so uh, sometimes we have to explain, like, what a parable is. And, and sometimes it gets related to a fable, like it's a story with a lesson in the end that teaches something, and that's completely true, but it actually goes a little bit further than that. A parable actually literally means alongside of. It's, it's a story that teaches a lesson that goes alongside of something else. So sometimes it goes alongside of what's happening in the context, in the narrative. Sometimes it's a, it's a story that is told alongside of some other teaching and sometimes it's a story that is told alongside of other stories and you can only really understand the meaning by putting all of those things together by putting the meaning that was explained here with the meaning that was explained here and grouping it all together now jesus says that he spoke in parables for a really specific reason and when i think about the reason he spoke in parables i think of when i used to teach students I was often known for doing really strange things, like, like really bizarre things that would just make people's head kind of tilt. There was one time, it was my favorite thing to do, was I would put grass on the student seats, like just a pile of grass that I would grab from outside, and I would put a pile here, and a pile there, and a pile there. And normally students, like they don't care what you have to say, like they don't, generally. They're not listening. They don't care. It's very hard to get their attention. But when they would see the grass on the seats, they would come in and immediately go, why is there grass? Why is there, why is there grass on the seats? Beth, what's the grass about? Tell me what's the grass about. Like all of a sudden it piqued their interest. They're asking me questions. They're begging me for information. They want to know what is this thing all about. Well, Jesus says this is the same reason he teaches in parables. There were certain people that didn't really want to hear what he had to say. They weren't ready to hear what he had to say. And so he spoke in these parables and these stories that piqued their interest and got them to ask these questions. What is this all about? What is the kingdom of God? What are you talking about? Why did you come here to earth? Wait, what is that? And then for other people who were ready to hear what Jesus had to say, the parable made the point crystal clear. They could see it if they were ready to hear it. They could, they could listen to the story, and they immediately knew, and it stuck with them for a really, really long time. 
And so Jesus taught in these parables, but it's important for us to understand that when we engage with a parable, there's always this key question that we have to ask ourselves. And the question is, where am I in the parable? Where am I in the parable? Now, oftentimes we like to put ourselves in the parable in a place that we don't actually belong in the parable. We like to put ourselves in the hero position, and Jesus is like, mm, nope, <laughs> you're not the hero. <laughs> and so as we listen to these parables over the next couple weeks, I want to challenge you to continuously ask yourself, where am I in the parable? Who am I in the parable? Now, these parables that Jesus teaches in Matthew 13 are actually super, super timely. Like, so much of Scripture, so much of Scripture is, is super timely. It, it didn't just speak to them in this powerful way back then. It, it actually, like, speaks to our time and our culture and particularly the state of the church right now in this really, really cool way. Now, when I talk about the state of the church, let me just give you a few statistics. If you were born between the year 1925 and 1945, there is a 60% chance that you are in church today. If you were born between 1946 and 1964, there's a 40% chance that you are in church today. If you were born between 1965 and 1983, there's a 20% chance that you are in church today. And if you were born after 1984, there is a less than 10% chance that you are in the church today. Now think about these statistics for a second. These paint a very, very, very bleak picture of the state of the church. I mean, Jesus said that the, that the church would prevail and the gates of hell would, would not come against it, that the kingdom would grow and flourish, and yet here are our statistics. Here is the place that we are at, and it sometimes can leave us, especially those of us who were born in some of those way earlier years, it can leave us being in the state of looking around and saying, what is going on? And what is going to happen? How is this going to play out, and how is this going to end? Now, I bet after you put yourself in these categories, and you looked at the dates and found what is, how did you beat the odds, right? Chances are you thought of a child, or a parent, or a spouse, or a coworker, and you started to identify where do they fit in all of this? Where are they? What are their odds? What are the chances of them engaging in the church and accepting the kingdom? And that can be really, really hard. That can make you oftentimes feel shocked and surprised and kind of put you in a state of being like, ugh, what is going on here? This isn't how it's supposed to happen. And, and maybe it's even putting you in a place of thinking, this really isn't worth it. The world has totally rejected the message of Jesus, and so let's just huddle together. The remaining of us who have lucked out and engaged in the church, like, let's just hang out together and let's, let's just be here. Let's just be in the church together. Now, this all may seem new, the, the declining church as it looks. It, it may seem totally new, but the reality is, is that this is the cyclical pattern that has happened over and over and over again throughout history. In fact, the early followers of Jesus felt the exact same way. They felt the same way as they're standing next to Jesus. They felt the same way. And, and we can see that if we read the book of Matthew really carefully, you see Matthew was a follower of Jesus and he took his experiences of walking around with Jesus for those three years. He took them and he put them into a book. He, he wove them together in a tapestry. And he wanted us to understand what was happening when when Jesus was here on earth. And so he begins to introduce, at the very beginning of Matthew, he introduced the birth of Jesus. And he introduced Jesus in a specific way that if you're reading really carefully, you can start to see that Matthew harks back and aligns Jesus to be the new Abraham. He is the one that this promised family would come through. Matthew sets up Jesus to be the new Moses. He puts him on top of a mountain preaching sermons just like Moses stood on top of a mountain and held the Ten Commandments. He, he sets up Jesus to be understood as the new king 
in the line of David. And so Matthew helps us understand all three of these things because those were the three requirements for Jesus to be the Messiah, for Jesus to be the one who ushered in the new kingdom of God here on earth. And the new kingdom of God was really just God's amazing, awesome rescue plan. It was this mission that we would all be saved, that we would all have an opportunity to engage and be with God again. And so Matthew is sort of setting up this whole thing that there is a new kingdom. And Jesus begins to preach about this new kingdom and tell people about this new kingdom. And then he doesn't just preach about it. He wants to bring it into the fabric of their lives. And so Jesus doesn't just talk. He starts acting. He starts healing people. He starts making the blind see. He starts to bring the dead to life. He heals people and he says the kingdom is this. And the kingdom is now. And he says that he is the one who is bringing the kingdom. And then every time he heals somebody, he turns to the people and he says, follow me. This is the kingdom. This is what it looks like. This is how great it is. Now follow me. And then in chapter 10 of Matthew, he, those people who have chosen to follow him, he says, all right, now I want you to go out. You go preach the gospel. You go tell people about the coming kingdom. You go heal the people. Bring the kingdom to earth. Go do it. But he wants to make sure that as the people go out, they understand how that word is going to be received. And so Matthew begins to tell these stories of how Jesus was sometimes accepted, that people would praise him and say, you're the Messiah, you're the one. But then he tells these other stories of how some people were like, I don't know who you are. John the Baptist, his own family was like, wait, are you the Messiah? I'm confused. And then there were these other people that Matthew tells us about that completely rejected him, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the people who were supposed to be the ones who recognized him were like, "Mm, you're not him. You're not the king. You are not the one bringing the kingdom. And so Jesus begins to preach parables to the disciples to get them ready, to make sure that they understood that some people would accept Jesus and some people would reject Jesus and the kingdom. And that is really the context of Matthew 13. And so it speaks to us now when we're wondering why all the rejection Why is the church not growing? And it speaks to them then in the ancient context when people right in front of Jesus were saying, "Mm, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. And so Jesus tells this story. He says this parable. He says that a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. And some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. And it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. Now, I think it's really interesting some of the details of this parable, what Jesus is trying to communicate with this parable. First, I think it's really interesting that he says the sower scattered the seed. Now, when I think of scattering seed, I think of when we lived in Phoenix, every October you would have to plant new grass. It was called your winter grass because Your summer grass was really hardy, so it could survive the sun, but your winter grass could, was a little bit cooler. So you would go out in any areas of your lawn that were grassy, and you would actually hack down and mow the old grass until it scorched and died. And then you would go and you would scatter the winter grass seed all over, all over, okay? You were super generous, you were indiscriminate, you just scattered all the seed everywhere and you let it grow. Now, I think this is very different. He doesn't describe a farmer who plants corn, where one, two, three, four, right? He doesn't do that. He says he went out and he scattered this seed. He just 
threw it out everywhere. He was generous. He was indiscriminate. It just went out. And I think it's also really interesting that he uses seed, right? If it was just about um, being generous with what you give, then it could have been, like he could have used the parable, there was a man in a parade throwing candy out to the children, right? It could have been that. Or it could have been, um, there was a rapper who had a lot of money and he made it rain, right? So it could have been either one of those things, but he doesn't say that. He specifically uses seed. He specifically uses seed because in seed, it is dormant until there is life. It has tremendous power for life to grow, for something to happen, for it to reproduce and create fruit. And so he uses seed to get after this idea that is powerful and is alive. But the power of the seed is completely based on the soil that it falls on. It's completely based on the receptivity of the soil. And so Jesus describes that there are four soils. The first soil is this path soil. It's super, super hard. And when Jesus explains this parable of what the path soil is, he says that anyone who hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their hearts. That is the seed that is along the path. Now, I think about this visually, of a path that has been walked on so many times, that the dirt and the soil that are, make up the path have just hardened and hardened and hardened and hardened and, and have become so hard that when the seed lands on that hard soil, it becomes like a plate for the birds. And the birds, who is the evil one, it says, come in and snatch it away. There is no opportunity. There is no possibility for that seed to take root, for it to grow. It doesn't have permission to flower. And I think about how sometimes we experience these times in our lives or we experience people who have become so hardened to even talking about God, to even being open to the possibility of truth, that they find themselves and their hearts in this no position, that the second you bring it up, it's like, mm-mm, 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 mm-mm. Not going to talk about it. Not going to talk about it. And that is the soil of the people who are the path. They're in this no position to God, and they're so hard. Nothing, they don't have any permission to bear fruit. It's, it's not their fault. They, they have no permission. And then Jesus explains the second soil. He says it's the rocky soil, and he says that this soil, the seed falling on the rocky ground, refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. Yes, I've been waiting for this. This is awesome. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. And when trouble comes or persecution comes because of the word, they fall away quickly. Now, we all experience these times too. Maybe we experience other people or maybe we experience it within ourselves. But we have these opportunities where sometimes there's an awakening moment where all of a sudden, like, we come to church one Sunday and we are like, yes! That is Jesus. He spoke to me. It was powerful. I had all the feels. All of the feels happened all at once. And we get really, really excited about what is happening. But the problem becomes that the second we walk out of these doors, the second we walk away from that experience, we actually, we realize that we actually didn't cultivate a relationship with God. We just had an experience. We just had this emotional thing that happened inside of us, and we never really connected to the root. We never really connected to the source. So any change that we tried to make in our life, any sort of growth we tried to make happen was all conjured within our own effort. And guys, we are not a people that try harder to do better. We are a people that are transformed by connecting to the source of God, by the power of who he is. And so that's the rocky soil. Right? I tried really hard, but nope. No connection to God. They have an awakening moment, but, but they don't have a believing experience. They, they don't surrender themselves fully to the power of God. And then there's the third soil. 
Jesus calls this the thorny soil, and he says that the seed that fell among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth chokes the word, making it unfruitful. The problem with the thorny soil is that there was no cultivation. That though the seed fell on the ground, the soil itself might have been good. In fact, it probably was because it's got all this other stuff growing in it. It may have taken root. It connected with the life source of God. But the problem became that when it popped up out of the ground, there was all this other stuff in the way. There were all these other habits in the way. There were all these other addictions in the way. There were all of these other issues, poor relationships in the way. That when this thing tried to sprout up, it got suffocated. There was no cultivation. See, when you plant a garden, there's a process of clearing the ground. You have to make way for the new stuff to come. And so sometimes that requires us finding new habits, finding support groups for addiction, breaking off relationships that are not healthy so that this thing can grow up into something big. Now, I find it fascinating that so far the parable that Jesus has told us is all about the bleak and dreary reality of the kingdom. Every single seed that has fallen so far has not resulted in any proliferation it has been rejected, it has been cast aside, it has died. It has been eaten up, it has been swallowed whole. And yet Jesus is like, yeah, this is how it goes. He's not surprised by this at all. He, he doesn't seem to be surprised. He's like, this is how the kingdom is. This is the beginning of the kingdom. These seeds are thrown, and three-fourths of them are gobbled up and dies. He just kind of states it as fact. But Jesus doesn't want that to overshadow the truth that is found and the hope that is found in the good soil because then Jesus starts talking about the good soil. He says this, he says, but the seed falling on the good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 100, 60, or 30 times what is sown. See, the picture that Jesus paints is not hopeless, is that when the, soil does, when the soil is good, it not only grows itself, it reproduces itself, it multiplies, it produces a great harvest. So we go back to that question that we ask ourselves with all parables. Who are you? Which soil are you? Are you the hard soil? Or you've just said, no God, no God. No, no, no. I don't even want to hear it. And whatever seed falls on you just gets picked up. Are you the rocky soil? Where though you've had some awakening experiences, they haven't really resulted in true connection with God. Do you need to submit yourself to God and allow him to awaken you in belief? Beyond just your own effort and your own power, but have him transform you. Are you the thorny, thor, thorn, thorny soil that is crowded out by all of this other stuff that maybe there's some clearing that has to happen? Maybe there's some transformation, some laying down of habits that need to take place. Which soil are you? Now, I love that Jesus uses soil imagery because the reality is the soil changes. Like, it changes with, with a lot of work and some hardcore cultivation, and over time, often, soil changes. If you're a master gardener, you know exactly what to do to soften soil. You, you can change it from something that is hard and thorny and stony and would never grow anything into something that is good and life-giving and pleasant. And you know what is so great? God doesn't call me to be a master gardener. And he doesn't call you to be a master gardener. He calls himself the master gardener, that he is the one that offers transformation. And so if you could recognize in yourself, gosh, I'm a little hard. I'm a little in the no position. He can 
transform you to be in the yes position. Not like, hey, I believe everything and we're all, I mean, he can do that too. But, but sometimes what he starts with is, hey, let's just unravel just a little bit. Let's, let's soften a little more. Let's be open to the possibility that God may be doing something here. I don't want to say what, but maybe something. God is the master gardener that if you're the, the rocky soil, he's able to clear away the rocks. He's able to connect with you. He's able to cultivate that soil in such a way that it's not just the feels. It's the real believing. It's the real decision. And if you're the thorny soil, he's the master gardener that knows how to pluck those things out and say, no, 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 I'm going to come alongside you. I'm, I'm going to work with you. We're going to clear this ground so something amazing can come from nothing. He takes those soils and he makes them good soil. Now, for those of you who are like, no, no, no I'm the good soil, right? Remember that thing where I was like, hey, sometimes we put ourselves in the position we're not supposed to be in? Well, some of us may be good soil. Some of us. Maybe good soil. Maybe you identified yourself as good soil, and actually that's really, really great. Maybe you have seen in your life that you have borne fruit. Born fruit? Is the bare fruit born fruit, past tense? You've borne fruit? You are bearded fruit. <laughs> Go back with born fruit? You born fruit. You made fruit. Good job. <laughs> Fruit came from your life. <laughs> Perhaps that's you. you. You can look at your life and say, no, 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 there's fruit there. I, I have a connection with God. I have a root. He is my source. He is the thing that defines my identity. He is the thing that, that guides my decision making. And I have cultivated the soil. Like There have been habits that have been removed. There are relationships that have been ended. There are um, addictions that I have, have addressed and so I am the good soil. God is doing something in my life. And the crazy thing about being the good soil is that this is like a cyclical parable. Because once you're the good soil, you know who you become? The sower. You become the sower. It says that the good soil reproduces itself. It, it yields a great harvest. It produces 60, 30, 100 times what was once sown. And so Jesus is trying to get at this idea that if you're the good soil, you then become the sower. Now, I have a confession to make. I, I recognize my call to be a sower. But sometimes I'm not a generous and indiscriminate sower of seeds. Sometimes I am a very begrudging, resentful sower of seeds. I joke with my, I've used this analogy before, but sometimes I'm the oh, uh, of course sower. I'm the one who, when somebody turns away from something, when a relationship ends or, or somebody just like, they get really excited and they're like, I'm in, this is it, we're going the distance, here we go, Jesus. And then like I never see them again. I kind of have this response of like, oh, of course. Of course that would happen. I become so often and so easily the, oh, of course, sower, rather than the generous and indiscriminate sower that I am called to be. I, I start trying, and I think we all do this. We try to, like, make sure, like, hey, I don't have enough seed to go everywhere. I don't have enough kindness to go around. I don't have enough relational equity in order to invest in all of you. So let me pick what is the best soil. Who's really worth this seed that I'm going to scatter. The problem is that we cannot predetermine who's what soil. We cannot look at a person and say, you're that soil. And you can't even look at past events and say, well, they acted this way in the past, so that's the soil they are. Because the reality is, is soil changes because we serve a master gardener who is constantly working behind the surface, who's constantly changing things and tilling things and adding things and taking away things. And so our call is not to pick who gets the seed and who doesn't get the seed. Our calling 
as the sower is to scatter the seed and be incredibly generous and engage our neighbors and love the poor and talk to the person who doesn't seem to deserve a conversation and ask the questions and mentor the kids and do all the things to love all the people so that we could see the seed that we scattered raised to life in Christ. That's our call. That's what this parable is all about. And so when we look at the statistics of the church and we, we look at the people we're in relationship with, when we look at our own life and we see the dead and we see the hard and we see the rocky and we see the thorny, our job is to cry out to God and say, transform me, transform them, transform all of us and let me scatter that seed. That is our call. Now we sang this song earlier. We sang this song called Miracles. You are the God of miracles. And perhaps that is what you need to hear this morning. Perhaps you are looking at your own life and the hardness of your own soil or the rockiness or the thorniness of your own soil. Or perhaps you're looking at the goodness of your soil and thinking about being a sower and being like, yeah, I don't want to be that. <laughs> I'm not interested. My challenge to you is to call out to the God of miracles, to call out to the master gardener and say, change me and transform me. And maybe for some of you here this morning, your call is not just for yourself. It's for somebody else that's in your life. It's for your child. It's for your parents, for your spouse, a coworker, a friend. To say, God, I am going to keep scattering that seed, but man, would you do some soil cultivation? Would you create some transformation in this place? And maybe you even need some encouragement to be faithful, generous sowers. So I'm going to invite the band to come up. And we're going to sing together. And I want to invite you that, that in response to God, I want to invite you to engage our stations. The worship that happens inside of us sometimes can benefit if we have something outside of us, something tangible to engage with. And so we've created and set up some stations for you to engage with God through. One of them is the cross over here, and, and there are some post-it notes, and you can write a prayer request. If there is something that you need prayer for, you want to call out to God about something in your own life or something in somebody else's, that, that you would be able to post that on the cross. There's communion stations set up front that if you want to engage God through communion, you can do that. Or if there is darkness in somebody's life and you want to pray and ask God to bring light into that darkness, clarity into that chaos, we have the candles over here and you can light a candle as a symbol that God's light shines. Will you pray with me? Father God, I, I am always amazed that you were so smart. <laughs> you knew all the questions we were going to have, all the frustrations, all of the surprises before they ever even came. And Father, you answered those questions that, that though it seems like there's so much hardness and there's so much rejection of your kingdom, Father, you say that the kingdom will multiply, that there will be a great harvest. And so, Father, we trust. We trust that you are the master gardener. We trust that you are the one who can change hearts and minds. And so we cry out to you to change our hearts and our minds. We cry out to you to transform us into sowers that love people well. Father, we want to see life. And so we cry out to you as the one who is the source of life to come into this place and bring us to life, bring your people to life. In your holy and precious name, amen.